السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and all his companions And to bless every single one of us and to accept from us the sacrifice that we are making in this month of Ramadan, although compared to the sacrifices of the prophets and the messengers, it is absolutely nothing what we are going through. But we still ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us strong and to accept it from us and to grant us every form of goodness. Beloved brothers and sisters, we are in the midst of a very powerful story of one of the most powerful messengers, the one who was granted the highest status from all the prophets besides Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes mention of the fact that when he went up in Mi'raj, when he went up to the seven heavens, he was taken up physically by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously. He met Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam in the seventh heaven, closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I'd like to share with you something very, very powerful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this young Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam as one with a pure heart, a perfect heart, the heart that had no spiritual defect at all. Listen to what he says after he makes mention of the story of Noah, may peace be upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمٌ إِذْ جَاءَ رَبَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ And from the family of Noah, from his offspring, there was one messenger known as Ibrahim. He met his Rabb, he found his Rabb, and he had met his Rabb, he came to his Rabb. With a perfect heart. Look at the word used. Qalbin Salim. And this is why the same Ibrahim told his father. He says, oh my father, I am worried about the day when all this wealth and all these children and everything will not help you. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ on the day of judgment, no amount of wealth will help you. No amount of children will be able to help you. Except the only thing that will help you is if you have come on that day with a calm heart, a perfect heart, a clean heart, a heart that has not engaged in any form of association of partnership with the maker. And Ibrahim alayhi salam from a young age understood that I need to only worship my maker and I will face a lot of trial as I am getting closer and closer to my maker. So from a young age, if we picture what was said yesterday when he looked at the idols, when everybody was gone, a child from amongst us would probably feel scared if they were brought up believing that these stones are gods. They would not feel the power to be able to be alone with them and then talk to them and then break them. Imagine what type of a perfect heart this young child had. He did not fear at all. Nothing. Subhanallah. That is Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. And he knew for a fact that I have a Rabb. I have a maker. That is the only one who can save me. And he also knew that as I am the closest one to my maker, my life is not going to be rosy. My life is not going to be full of ease because he knew from the very beginning that life is only a test. This is what I think we don't understand. Many of us think I am reading salah, I am making dua, I am engaging in fasting, I am reading Quran, I am trying my best, I am abstaining from sin. Why is my life not rosy? Why do I still have turbulence? Why do I have problems? Well, Ibrahim was one of the highest and he had problem after problem, but he never looked at it as a problem. He looked at it as a beautiful test from Allah, a challenge one after the other, a test, an opportunity to gain even more closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalah. It is only when Allah loves a slave that he puts tests in his life. And another narration says, Idhamul ajri ma'a'idhami libtilah. The greater the test, the greater the reward. The bigger rewards are with those tests that are far greater. Ibrahim alayhi salam had some of the greatest tests. As we said, he is a Nabi who was so high after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which means the day we study the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will find even greater tests than that. He didn't even have a father. Which means he was an orphan, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. With Ibrahim alayhi salam, his parents were there. But he had to challenge his own parents. So this is what is meant by the tests of life, my beloved brothers and sisters. The closer you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more tests he is going to put in your life. So it is just the condition of the heart that will determine whether you are actually in a test of Allah or whether it is punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us from punishment and may he grant us all hearts that will definitely be full of peace and ease. Ameen. Yesterday we had ended where we were making mention of the story of Nimrud. When Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam destroyed the idols and he had placed that axe which he used one narration says on the, on the ear or the bulk of the historians and the narrations make mention of around the neck, around the neck or the shoulder of this particular idol. And thereafter, they, the community faced him and they decided to create a fire for him and they threw him in it and he came out of it scot-free. In fact, he walked out of it as though he had come out of some cool place. And when the king heard of it, he decided to call him. And this Nimrod was granted a lot of power by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah makes mention of the story in the Quran. Alam tara ila alladhi hajja Ibrahim fi rabbihi an atahu Allahu al-mulk. Do you see the one who decided to argue and debate with Ibrahim regarding Ibrahim's Rabb, regarding the one whom Ibrahim was worshipping, just because Allah had given him kingdom and Allah gave him authority. Which means if he did not have that authority, he wouldn't have called Ibrahim alayhi salam to debate with him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those whom, when Allah has given us a little bit of the authority on land, it humbles us down. And we become closer to the ground as possible. And we return and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتُ قَالَ أَنَا أُحْيِي وَأُمِيتُ There were people who used to worship this king. He used to call himself a god. As we heard yesterday, they not only worshipped idols, but they also started worshipping human beings. So the king says, who is the one you worship, O Ibrahim? So Ibrahim says, I worship the one who gives life and takes that life. He gives death. So this king thought he's talking to a youngster who doesn't have a mind or a brain good enough. So he says, well, I give life and I also cause death. And what did he do? The historians make mention of the fact that he brought in two prisoners who were meant to die, which means who were sentenced to death. And he said, look, I'm giving life, free him. And he was freed. And look, I've given death, kill that one. He was killed. So Ibrahim alayhi salam looks and decides, you know what? There's no point in arguing with a fool. This man doesn't understand what life we're talking about. The, the whole gift of life that we enjoy, the life as we have from the beginning to the end, the life when it started, all that is what I'm meaning. But if I talk to this fool in that way, he's not going to understand it. So the best way is to ignore that. Now let me attack him on another line. Something he will not be able to talk about. He says, okay. Ibrahim alayhi salam looks at him and says, okay. Simple question. Ibrahim says, okay, I worship the one, Allah, who causes the sun to rise from the east. I want you to cause it to rise from the west. Then I will worship you. He was defeated completely. He was a disbeliever. He had no answer, no response. Imagine a, a young man 
shab telling a king without fear why because he had a qalbun salim he had a clean heart solid he knew nothing can harm me besides allah allahu akbar so allah says wallahu la yahdi alqawm adh-dhalimin allah will not guide those who are oppressors the lesson we have to learn from that if we are oppressors yes the term zulm is used to mean and to refer to shirk to refer to association of partnership with Allah that is the greatest dhulm and this is mentioned in the Quran inna shirka la dhulmun azim definitely association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest form of oppression greatest so anyone who engages in that Allah says we don't guide him we throw him out because he's not looking for guidance you need to cleanse yourself from that first come onto the path and seek the guidance then Allah will guide you but over and above that the umum ma'na dhulm the, the broader meaning of the word oppression includes when we oppressing people when we are doing something wrong because the term dhulm is wad'u shay'i fi ghayri mahallihi to put something where it does not belong so naturally when a person is going to steal he is oppressing when a person is using vulgar language or when a person is engaged in that which they are not meant to be engaging in they have engaged in oppression so when a person is committing sin and they are not interested in turning to allah how is allah going to guide them this is why allah says وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا it is those who struggle and strive to come towards us whom we shall open the doors of guidance for if you are struggling and striving to go towards Allah you are making an effort you are spending your resources in trying to find Allah in trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will open the doors of guidance if you're looking for that guidance so now after this the king was silenced Ibrahim alayhi salam left and he decides look I need to disappear from this area because they warned him they said we are going to kill you they said we are going to kill you we are going to stone you to death and this was a threat that they had made he decided physically I don't want to fight the only person who's accepted my message is Lut Allah says in the Quran فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوتُ the one who accepted his message was Lut at some stage there was a female who accepted his message his own wife Sarah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace be upon the two of them. He took the two of them and decided, I, need, I now need to go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him a place to go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to send him further up north to the holy lands, the land of Sham. Sham today is made up of a few countries, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. Those areas put together, that entire region is called a Sham. So he went and mashallah he settled around close to what we know as Jerusalem today. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us there inshallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to liberate it for us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us victory and to grant us peace and stability across the globe. Ameen. So as Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was going there, he stopped at a certain place called Harran. And Harran, he thought, let me stop here and I will call these people towards Allah. Because only two people have accepted this message. And he gave up his family. He gave up his parents. He gave up his community. He gave up absolutely everything. Nothing harmed him. He walked out. Imagine, he walked out without fearing that anything is going to harm him. Because he knows Allah is on my side. And he continued. And then he got to Harran and he found that there the situation was even worse. Was even worse. What were they doing in Harran? They were worshipping the stars. He found people, they did not worship stones and sticks. They worshipped the stars. And the beauty of it was that when they called out to the stars, they found results. They got results. Where did these results come from? It is also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find some people, they decide to go to the Sangomas. I'm sure we know about people whom when they're sick or something happens, they go to a witch doctor, a fortune teller. When they go to that Sangoma, they get cured. Hey, they're excited. They're happy. Hey, I got cured. They send other people there. That does not make it right. Not at all. That is in fact a bigger test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
a bigger test. Remember, what is wrong is wrong, even if you are achieving something good by it. When a person goes to steal, he gets a lot of money, but that's wrong. So when a person goes to get his health back in a way that is wrong, he might get his health back, but it's still wrong. I hope we understand the example. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So it's a test from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them in that way. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam decided, you know, I need to speak to them properly. Firstly, we're only three. These people are a whole community. And I am here. Let me start talking to them in their language. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as he was sitting with them, As the night came and the darkness fell, he saw a star and he said loudly, this is my Rabb. There is a chance, there is a possibility, this is my Rabb. They're all looking at him. They're like sort of happy. Hey, this is one of us. But he did not consider it, nor was he ever considering it. He was Qalbun Salim from the beginning. He had a pure heart from the beginning. Some people when they read these verses of the Quran, they translate them as though Ibrahim alayhi salam had a doubt and he was looking at the stars and thinking, should I worship this? Should I worship that? No. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, absolutely not. What happened was in Harran, Ibrahim alayhi salam decided to use it as a method of explaining to them step by step to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when that planet that was appears as a star, some narrations say the planet Venus, as it set and it stopped appearing, he looked and he says, where's that star that I was worshipping just now moments ago? When it set, he quickly said, I don't like those things that set. Because if they set, what am I going to do? It's weak. This, now if I've got a problem right now, what do I do? I've got to wait for it to come back the following night in order to call out to it. So they were looking at him. They were slightly convincing themselves that yes, this man is speaking sense. And now what happened? He said, look, I found something bigger than that. What was it? He saw the moon, big. And he says, okay, this is much bigger than that one we had just now. I think this might be a Rabb. This might be my Rabb. So they're looking, they're happy also. Yes, he's contemplating, considering. When it's set, he said, if my maker, look at how he's going back to the word maker. If my maker does not guide me, my Lord does not guide me, then I will be from amongst those who are astray. Because I cannot worship this, it is now gone. And suddenly, at sunrise, the sun appeared. When the sun appeared, it was shining. Now, these people used to worship stars, not the sun. But look, Ibrahim alayhi salam is showing them there's something bigger than the stars. The moon. The moon also goes. There's something bigger than the moon. The sun. He says, He looked at the sun and he says, Okay, this thing has now risen. It is the biggest from all of those. I think this must be the Rabb. It is more deserving of being a Rabb than those two things that just went by. Now when it's set, what was left? There's nothing left now. The stars, gone. The moon, gone. The sun, gone. When the sun sets, what if you have a problem at night? Now who do you call out to? You got to wait 12 hours for that thing to come back up before you can say, hey, I got a problem. So what did he say? He said, Oh my people, I am free. I disassociate myself completely from that which you are associating as partners with the one who made the skies, the earth, the stars, the moon, the sun, myself and yourselves. 
who ever made me you and all these creatures in existence whoever he is i owe my entire worship solely and only to him and i will never ever associate a speck of partnership with that maker of mine look at how powerful this man was he was given the power we're going to come to that verse so immediately they started arguing with him these people started debating with him and there was a give and take speech they are saying things he is responding they are saying things he is responding then he said how can you debate with me about my own maker about my creator about allah and he has guided me he has given me guidance i know that what i am doing is definitely correct i do not have a speck of doubt and this is why when we are worshiping allah and allah alone without anything together with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know we are on the right path nobody can shake us not at all once you've tasted that you will never go back Allahu Akbar because you know your Rabb is with you this was the taste of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam when he tasted that I am worshipping Allah alone there was nothing more he needed he could argue he could debate he could destroy those that were called gods besides Allah today if we are to walk into a place and we find people worshipping stones and sticks and so on and what have you and you know if we had to purchase a house and in it we found all these things we would rather call the previous owners and say, look, take your things away. Some people might feel scared to dispose of this and to destroy it. Why? You just bought the house. You can actually destroy it and fulfill the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, we are not calling to the destruction or for the destruction of what others are worshipping at the moment. Leave it. Let them do what they want. Because it's a free world out there. But we are saying, if you've purchased a property and you find something in it, in your own property, you can destroy it. There's no problem, no harm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. And may He use us to promote true peace on the globe. And may He use us really to serve His cause. And may He use us to let the masses turn to Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this debate. And after that He says, I do not fear anything that you are associating as partners with Allah. They can do nothing to me unless my own creator wills that something bad happen to me or anything happens to me. They cannot harm me. They cannot benefit me. I don't fear them at all. The only thing I fear, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my maker, wants something, it can happen. If he doesn't want it, it won't happen. Then he, he tells them, he asks them a question. A powerful question. He says, listen to how powerful the question is. A young man asking a question. How can I fear those things that you are associating as partners with Allah when you are not fearing the fact that you have associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You not fearing Allah and the fact that you've associated partners with Him and you want me to fear those partners that you have taken as partners with the Maker, with the Creator. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. How? So he says, look, out of us, the two parties, who is more deserving of peace and comfort and contentment and protection? Those who have believed and they have not contaminated their iman with any association of partnership with Allah. They are more deserving of comfort, contentment, protection, and they are the ones who are rightly guided. And then Allah says, وَتِلْكَ حُجَّتُنَا آتَيْنَاهَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ 
that was the power of debate that we gave to Ibrahim over his people. Allah says we gave him the power of debating over his people. It was the sign. It was the evidence against his own people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him. What a powerful statement. Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran, if you turn the pages of the Quran, you will see in a lot of places he uses the word fatir. Fatir meaning creator. He says, Illa fatarani, The one who created me, the one who created the skies, Fatirus Samawati, the one who made this, the one who made that. He always used to refer to the maker because you cannot dispute that. So when we are calling people to Islam, we should always tell them in Islam, we only worship our maker. Whoever made me, I call him the worshipped one and I put my head on the ground for him alone and nobody else. This is called the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. The path and the teaching and the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So after that, they started threatening him to kill him. Look at this. Once again, another person threatening to kill. And look at this man as he's now growing in age. And he's got a perfect heart. It does not shake him at all. He had a problem in his own community. They threatened to kill him. He left. Now he went to Harran. He's calling these people. He knocked them out in debate. Look, this is the Nabi who debated the most. May Allah's peace be upon him. He debated with his parents. He debated with his community. He debated with the king. He debated with this one. He debated with the people in Harran. And each time he defeated them completely. This is the meaning of the term hujjah. That Allah gave him the power, really. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that evidence against his people. The ability to not only to... to engage them in discussion but to overpower them in such a way that they have no answer so when a person has no answer what do they do when you when you have overpowered someone and now they've got no answer and they still don't want to surrender they need to start threatening you physically i'll beat you up why because now there's no more there's nothing left you can only become physical Allahu Akbar. It shows they have defe been defeated completely so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what a beautiful word. What a beautiful word. Listen to this word where he disassociates himself from what they were doing. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ إِنَّنِي بَرَاءٌ مِّمَّا تُشْرِكُونَ إِلَّا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي فَإِنَّهُ سَيَهْدِينَ وجعلها كلمة باقية في عقبه لعلهم يرجعون. And remember when Ibrahim alayhi salam told his father and his people that I am bara, I am totally free. I disassociate myself completely from what you have engaged in as terms of association of partnership with the Creator. The only one I worship is the one who made me. Illa ladhi fatarani. The one who made me is whom I worship. Fa innahu sayahdin. He will guide me. So Allah says, Jaalaha kalimatan baqiyatan fi aqibi. And He left it as a word and a statement that remained in His offspring forever. In the offspring of Ibrahim alayhi salam, what was the statement? This was the statement. La ilaha illa Allah. That's the statement. There is none worthy of worship besides one who made you. Finished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he uttered that statement, he made sure he taught it to his offspring. And Allah says, we kept it for him in his progeny after him. Amazing. Because of the sacrifices. With us, as I said moments ago, we become happy when we have engaged in salah, when we have done our zakah, when we have done our fasting, when we have engaged in so many deeds, when we have abstained from sin, and then we say, but why is my life still a mess? These were the anbiya, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They loved being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thereafter he left Harran. He went to Harran and he decided to go to the closer area of Sham. He went into Sham and after some time there was a drought there. 
And when there was a drought there, he decided, let me leave this place with my family. So he instructed Lut alayhi salam to head to a certain area. And that area, Lut alayhi salatu was salam settled in a place known as Sodom. Sodom. We will get to that inshallah when we speak about Lut alayhi salam after Ibrahim alayhi salam in a few days time inshallah. But Lut alayhi salam went and Ibrahim alayhi salam took his wife and started walking to in a certain direction and he was heading for Egypt. And when he got to Egypt, there was a king. The king in Egypt was a tyrant. He had been ruling for many, many years. And whenever there's a newcomer, everybody knew that there's someone coming from outside, a foreigner, a stranger, from dialect, from language, from, you know, physical features. You can see that this man is not from here. It's quite simple. Even here in Cape Town, or mind you, Cape Town, mashallah, is a rainbow city. So it's not so easy to tell. But whenever you go somewhere, you can tell this man, you know, is from outside. And you know, if you really cannot tell, let him open his mouth and you will tell, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, the, the, the people who were close to the king went to describe to him what? This woman who came in with Ibrahim alayhi salam, his wife, Sarah, may peace be upon them both. And they said, oh, there's a beautiful woman who's walked in and she is so beautiful. And this is what, you know, she's coming with a man and so on. Now they had a habit. What was the habit? Whenever there was a man who was married to someone and they wanted her, they killed him off. Done. Kill him off and take her away. It's over. So they said, bring her. The king says, bring her. So as they came to Ibrahim, who are you and what is happening? He understood immediately that these people, they have a bad intention. So the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, there is a narration where the Prophet sallallahu says, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had to use a certain type of statement three times in his life, which although it is not a clear cut lie, but the way it sounded, it sounded like a lie, thrice. The first time was when he told him, look, I'm sick. When he wanted to destroy the idols and he says, Inni saqim, I'm sick. What he meant is not I'm physically sick, although that's what they understood. He meant I'm sick and tired of what you people are doing and I don't want to come. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of how Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, when he destroyed those idols, they told him, who broke, who destroyed these idols? He looked at them and he says, بَلْ فَعَلَهُ كَبِيرُهُمْ هَذَا فَاسْأَلُوهُمْ إِن كَانُوا يَنْطِقُونَ I think it's the big one here that did it. Why don't you ask him and he might tell you if he can talk. Now this was obviously something that was common sense. We can't call it a lie, but for them it was a lie because they actually thought, yes, maybe, you know. And then they realized quickly that no, this can't happen. So that was the second one. The third one was now when the king sent a message and they're asking, who's this woman with you? He said, it's my sister. And they had separated the two. Why did he say my sister? If he said, it's my wife, they would have killed him and taken her away. But now that he says my sister, that means there's a problem there. Because now she probably has a family and what have you and so on and you know, not married. So we can still take her and we don't need to kill him. We can take her, we don't need to kill him. So at least his life was saved. Life-saving, mashallah. With us, forget about life-saving. We lie on a daily basis. On a daily basis. For nothing sometimes. Allahu Akbar. Allah open our doors and grant us understanding. A man comes in, they ask him simply, what happened? He says, hey, today, I made 50,000 rands. Why do you want to lie? And you know in your pocket there's nothing. You just want to seem like a big guy. That's all. Allahu Akbar. May Allah open our doors. I mean, these are just little lies that people don't understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us with the lips of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَا يَكْذِبُ حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَذَّابًا A person who lies will continue lying until they are written in the books of Allah that this man is a liar. So let's abstain even from the little lies. Imagine Ibrahim alayhi salam, it wasn't a lie as such, but he had to save his life and then listen to what happened. They had separated the two. They asked him questions separately. Who's this woman? So he says, she's my sister. Now, they said, okay. They left them and as they were, they were now taking them, he, he quickly looked at her and he says, hey, look, this is what happened. They asked me who you are. I said, you're my sister. And remember, 
make sure you also utter the same statement. We don't want conflicting statements between us here. You say something, I say something, there's a problem. So mashallah, Allah gave him the opportunity and the chance to quickly let her know. She understood it. And he said, look, they, they're heading for you. They're probably planning something. Remember, you have a maker. He will protect you. Allahu Akbar. No stone, no idol, no nothing. Nothing. They were not worried, not at all. I told you, Qalbun Salim, heart, which was perfect. He, uh, he knew Allah's there. So what happened is, they called her in. Who are you? This is what my name is. This is where I come from. And who is that man? Well, he's my brother. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam had told her already, that look, I'm not lying. You know, you are my sister in Islam. We are the only two believers here. <laughs> we are the only two believers. You are my sister in Islam. No? Subhanallah. Now we use the term sister in Islam wrongly sometimes. <laughs> you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. Really, when it comes to the issue of intermingling, when it comes to the issue of uh, other items that are haram, not allowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you tell a man, look brother, why are you doing this? He says, well, look, she's my sister in Islam. Fair enough. We are using it in the wrong way. With Ibrahim alayhi salam, he used it correctly. He quickly explained to her. She understood that this is my husband. He's not lying. And at the same time, this is what I need to say. So when they asked her, she happily said, he is my brother, meaning brother in Islam. And at the same time, the king decided, right? He called his, the women folk to adorn her. And he says, I'm marrying her and we're taking her. And now place her in the bedroom and get her ready. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. She made a dua. She says, Oh Allah, I have worshipped you and you alone. And Ya Allah, I have kept myself pure and clean for my husband. Completely pure. Ya Allah, you protect me and safeguard me. And what happened? There are three different narrations as to exactly what happened, but the conclusion is the same. Let me mention all three, because sometimes when you're reading the story, you might read one of the three, and I will tell you which one is the most correct as well. The first, they say that as he went to touch her, when he got to the room and he went to touch her, she made a dua and, Allah, and he was suddenly paralyzed by his hand. He couldn't move further. So it was just him and her. So he says, if you pray to your Lord to cure me, I'll release you. So she prayed to Allah and said, Ya Allah, cure him. So as he was cured, he dropped his hand and he went for her again. So she, he was stuck for the second time. Now she's worried because she's a woman. She's all alone. Ibrahim alayhi salam is elsewhere. He's also making dua, most probably. And then when he was frozen for the second time, paralyzed, so to speak, he said the same statement for the second time. You make dua, you call out to your Rabb. And if I'm cured, I will release you imagine he knew that i can't call out to my gods because my gods firstly he used to call himself a god and secondly whatever they used to worship in terms of stones it's not going to help him at all so he knew that that's the god you know sometimes we have people of other faiths who come to us as muslims and they tell us you know bring us that zamzam from mecca why they have yaqeen in their hearts there's something about it allahu akbar wallahi I've, it's happened to me and people will come and say, look, we want the religious leaders from your religion to come. Why? They're trying the buttons. It's like a lottery. You know, if we're not cured by here, we're going to try there. If we're not cured by there, we're going to try there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. This man knew that the reason why I am being paralyzed is for this. The third time the same thing happened. She made a dua for the third time. And then he called his people and he said, you know what? You've sent me a devil. She's not a human. Send her away. So the third time. My beloved brothers and sisters, when people plan to commit a sin, Allah creates a barrier through his mercy between them and the sin. Sometimes a person wants to commit adultery and he's looked at the clock and he said, look, I'll meet you at 10. For some reason, he has a puncture. He has an accident. He has something that is Allah telling you, look, don't go. Not at all. You should take a lesson, go back and say, Ya Allah, you've saved me. Allahu Akbar. People plan to go to the gig, to the club, and suddenly they get news of something very bad that happened to this one, a family member or someone. It means don't go there. That's what it means. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. 
And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. What is the need to plan a sin in the first place? What is the need to plan a sin in the first place? We'd rather just be on the right side with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clear our slates. That is the one narration. And it is reported that he decided to give her a girl who would go with her and he gave her a few items and said, you can carry on and I don't worry now, I'm not going to touch you. I realized and you can go. And she was gone. The second narration is that as he was on the bed and he wanted to get closer to her, his legs started shaking and he realized. So he asked her to pray and so on. So instead of the hand, it was the legs in another narration. The third narration, which is the most correct, according to what I have seen, is that when he asked her or asked his people, his, the women folk in that palace to prepare her, they all got together and they started preparing her in the room and so on. And she was very, very sad, making dua to Allah. Ya Allah, save me. Ya Allah, I have protected myself. You have granted me this chastity, this protection. To this day, I have protected myself purely for my husband, Ya Allah. I have worshipped you alone. Ya Allah, grant me protection and savior. So as she was very sad, he walked in, he was very happy and he closed the doors. When he looked at her very sad, because he wanted her so desperately, he also became a bit sad. And when he became a little bit sad, he sat down and he's looking at her and he's offering her things and she was adorned in gold and silver and jewelry and what have you but she was sad she had forgotten about everything that was not interesting she was not interested in it at all and in the process this man fell off to sleep and when he fell off to sleep he'd seen in his dream he'd seen in his dream that this is what happened and he was he had to leave this woman untouched and release her back and let her go or he would see his own destruction so when he got up from his sleep he decided to give her a gift and what was the gift the gift was a girl this girl her name was Hajar the gift was given to her and she was told you can go and she went back to Ibrahim alayhi salam and they lived as husband and wife in Egypt for quite a long time and mashallah they had lots of barakah and blessings in their business. He had so much sheep and he had so much in terms of wealth and he became quite a wealthy person until they became jealous of him. They started becoming jealous of him. And so he decided instead of waiting for these people because jealousy leads you to plot the downfall of someone. I don't want to fight with these people. Let me now go away. Let me go back to Asham. I left there because of the drought. I'm going to go. So he took all whatever his belongings were and he went back to Jerusalem. He went back to Asham and that is where he settled once again with his wife Sarah. And he had this girl known as Hajar. Now who was this girl? Many people say she was a slave girl. She might have been their slave girl, but there is a narration that says she was the daughter of a nobleman, if not the king himself. And she, she was given as a gift. So when a human being is given as a gift, they would be considered slave in that time. But she had a very high lineage. This is also what one of the narrations say, although it is not so common. The most common narration say that she was a slave girl. She was a slave girl. However, I'd like to highlight to you that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was from her lineage. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we chose the purest line from Adam straight to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There wouldn't be slave girls in the process. So it's important for us to know that some of these narrations that do not appear in the Quran or in the correct narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at times we have to search for more narrations and to see until we get to a narration where it is stated that she was not a slave girl but she was given as a gift from the noble families of Egypt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding and inshallah we will continue the story tomorrow seeing that we are beaming live on many streams over the internet on many radio stations and so on. I think it's important for us inshallah to stop here and to continue inshallah tomorrow until we meet again. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammadin subhanallahi wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.